Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are the first iGEM team from the RWTH Aachen University and I would like to welcome you to our presentation, Cellar Combs, a case of identity. Biology is getting more and more accessible every day. This is true from supply of services to the diverse field of synthetic biology. As you know, every innovative biobrick needs an appropriate host cell to work properly. In the same way, every biological system or experiment needs the appropriate equipment to fulfill its function. While nowadays, every lab and researcher has easy access to suitable standardized cells, how many of you always have the ideal hardware at hand to realize your ideas or to measure your biological output? Why don't we combine not only computer science but also hardware engineering with synthetic biology? Why don't we enrich synthetic biology not only with the engineer's concept and methods, but also with the products. We believe in integration of low-cost do-it-yourself technology into synthetic biology. We feel that people with great ideas developing revolutionary biological systems should be given a toolbox to optimize their solutions with self-made, customized and low-cost equipment. We therefore aim to demonstrate the beneficial integration of do-it-yourself technology into synthetic biology by using multiple approaches. On top of building open source lab equipment at low cost, we develop devices tailored for simple and more complex biological applications. As a first step we took in order to realize our ideas, we wanted to build a standard piece of lab equipment that is low cost, is open source, uses readily available parts and is easy to build, that is portable and gives results as reliable as commercially available systems. We chose to build an optical density measurement device that is used just like a regular spectrophotometer. You can blank the system by simply pushing a button. Subsequently, you can exchange the blank with the sample and the result will be presented to the user on a display. With the help of our construction manual published on our wiki, I will now explain to you how our device is set up in detail. Let's start with the casing. It's made from black plexiglass. We had all parts laser cut at a local fab lab and the stencil is available for download on our wiki. The lid is also made from black plexiglass and when assembled looks like this. A central element of our device is the cuvette holder. This piece was 3D printed and is optimized to specifically fit the requirements of the device setup. At its side it has a hole for the light frequency sensor. An orange LED is placed in a hole opposite to the sensor. Through the use of a filter we ensure OD measurement at the usual wavelength of 600 nanometers. Let's have a look at the wiring next. To control our device, we use an Arduino microcontroller that is connected to the button, the plug, and the display via a breadboard. The control unit is located at the back of the device. This leaves space in the front for the cuvette holder. When you now attach the display to the lid and then close the casing, you get the finished OD device of our design. Instead of buying a handheld photometer for $700, the material cost of our device is just $60. It can be powered using a regular cell phone charger or any other USB socket. It weighs less than 200 grams, so you can easily carry it around in the lab or even take it into the field. Now, our device is cost effective and portable, but can the data quality really compete with commercially available systems? And the answer is yes, it can. This graph shows a function defined in the working range of our OD device that translates the transmission measured by the sensor into OD values. We tested this correlation using yeast and pseudomonas cells, and Team Freiburg currently tested it with their mammalian cells. This clear correlation shows that we are able to measure OD independently of cell type and shape, and over a great range of OD values, spanning three orders of magnitude. In comparison, the working range of a regular handheld photometer is only somewhere between 0.1 and 0.8. The main target group, from an economical point of view, are low-budget institutions, such as high schools. We therefore took our OD device to the Neander Lab, a laboratory where school classes can do a range of experiments from soldering to PCR. We organized a one-day workshop for a grade 11 biology class, where we introduced the students to synthetic biology, our iGEM project, and also did a lot of fun experiments, such as the one with the fluorescing fluids shown in this photo. We also did a growth experiment with E. coli, where the students measured the OD of the cultures every 30 minutes using our own OD device, and it worked great. In collaboration with another high school, the Kaiser Karls Gymnasium in Aachen, we developed an eight lessons teaching module on synthetic biology for a grade nine biology chemistry class. When preparing the lessons, we thought that 
not only being able to measure the OD, but also the fluorescence of liquid samples would unlock a large number of fun experiments for biology, chemistry, and physics class. Unfortunately, even simple fluorometers are quite expensive and unaffordable for most schools. Analogous to the OD device, we therefore developed the fluorescence measurement device, or F device for short. After testing this duct tape prototype with the grade 9 students, we of course refined our design. Achieving good data quality for the F device was a little bit more tricky than for the OD device, but in the end, we achieved a great correlation nonetheless. Shown in this graph is normalized data of a dilution series of E. coli culture expressing GFP, once measured with our F device in red, and a high end plate reader, the black line. As you can see, the F device is able to measure the fluorescence linearly over the full range of the dilution series. In fact, the only difference between the two data sets is the slope of the trend line, which is, however, a device-specific parameter. In July, a delegation of our iGEM team visited the Maker Fair in Hanover. This is a family-friendly exhibition from and for tinkerers of all kinds. Many visitors, engineers, scientists, hobbyists, and children alike, had a lot of fun measuring the properties of some colorful liquids using our devices. We also met many teachers that would love to use our devices to spice up their science classes. Throughout all our policy and practices work, we received a lot of very helpful and positive feedback and realized that our devices could actually have a great impact. We therefore wanted to take this one step further. Since the only difference between the OD and the F device really is the filter type and type and position of the LED, it just requires two sets of cuvette holders to combine both devices into one, the ODF device. This do-it-yourself piece of lab equipment for just $70 can measure both fluorescence and OD at a high degree of data quality. And if you want to combine some technology with your biology, just visit our wiki and download the necessary information to build your own ODF device. By building our ODF device, we illustrated the advantages of integrating DIY technology into biology at the level of generic lab equipment. In the same way, even more specific biological tasks can benefit from designing tailored devices. In cooperation with Team Braunschweig, for example, we assembled an online methane sensor from simple and inexpensive components for the measurement of methane in the gas phase of their cultivation. To further guarantee easy data collection, we wrote user-friendly software for direct data export into Excel sheets. Beyond developing technical solutions for rather simple biological problems, we faced our final challenge to tackle essential but more complex biological issues. For the centerpiece of our project, we chose a field of constantly ongoing research. The heart of our project combines biological, software and hardware components to develop a novel modular biosensor for pathogen detection on solid surfaces, cellar homes. What is on the tabletop? For a biologist, that's an easy question, right? microbes everywhere. But to tell which specific microorganism there is, that's a way harder question to answer. It might be even a pathogenic one. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an opportunistic human pathogen that is infectious even at low cell densities. It controls its virulence via chrome sensing. We used an existing biobrick based on chrome sensing with sensor cells immobilized in an agar chip. With that, we wanted to achieve a quantification of colony following units per surface area. We took our sampling chip, applied it on the surface, and then put it on top of another chip containing our sensor cells. The first step was to immobilize our sensor cells in an agar chip. We grew the cells in a pre-culture, centrifuged them, resuspended them, and then added liquid agar at the temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. We mixed it and then poured it in our specifically laser cut mold where it was left to solidify, then cut into its final size and it was then ready to use or it could be stored at 4 degrees for two days. However, there has not been a device to specifically detect fluorescent outputs of an, a 2D agar chip until now. I'm extremely proud to present Watson, who knows what's on the chip. Let me give you an insight into Watson. It consists of two compartments. In the outer one, you can find the Arduino. It controls the Peltier element, which is uh, crucial for heating. With that, you can set your perfect cultivation temperature 
for the sensor cells as well as for the pathogens. The Arduino also controls the relay, which can turn on and off the LEDs. We have various LEDs in our Watson, and therefore we can detect different fluorescent proteins. The Raspberry Pi triggers the camera, which takes a picture of our chip. Then the Raspberry Pi processes the image and displays it to the user. All components of Watson are modular. You can take, for example, the Arduino together with the Peltier element and set the perfect cultivation temperature for your experiment. We also developed an algorithm pipeline to analyze our chip images. It first uses statistical region merging. It combines regions of similar properties and therefore we can reduce the amount of possible candidate regions. The second step is the HSV thresholding. It selects regions of a specific color. The next step is the smoothness index. It screens for regions with a low color gradient. Basically, it favors big and round areas. The last step is the classification. It colors the selected region in red. Here's a comparison between the unanalyzed chip and our output by Majorati. We developed an automated chip analysis that is objective and, as you can see, very sensitive. However, we also wanted to improve our molecular strategy, as the traditional one just expresses GFP after induction and thus this takes a lot of time. In our approach, LAS-R is constitutively expressed. If the autoinducers of Pseudomonas aeruginosa are present, they bind to the LAS-R and combined they serve as a transcription factor. If the combined transcription factor binds to the promoter, the tobacco edge virus protease, or short TEV protease, is expressed. Also, a fusion protein is expressed constitutively. The fusion protein consists of a GFP linked to a dark quencher, the so-called REACH. REACH absorbs the fluorescence of the GFP. If the TEV protease is expressed, the linker is cut and a fluorescent output is generated. Prior to going to the lab, we modeled our molecular approach. The pool of fusion protein in blue is built up until induction. Then the TEV protease in orange is expressed, cutting the pool of uh, fusion proteins and releasing the GFP in green, producing a strong and fast fluorescent output. We also modeled the traditional approach with direct expression of GFP shown in black and you can see that our output is stronger and faster. To get a proof of concept, we built our system behind an IPDG inducible promoter. The graph shows that directly after induction, we get a strong and fast output. We revised our model to our system, and as you can see, the data fits pretty nicely. We also tested our system in a chip. Again, you can see that our system produces a way stronger and faster output as a traditional one. The chip production, the construction of our Cellox system, Watson and Majorati are modular, but as they come together, they solve our case of identity. During the last months, we've put a lot of effort into realizing and demonstrating our idea. To conclude, we've shown the beneficial integration of hardware engineering into synthetic biology by using multiple approaches. With our ODF device and policy and practices work, We've shown that generic lab equipment can be built from readily available parts and for a fraction of the cost. With Salok Homes and our collaborations, we have demonstrated that biological, software and hardware components can be combined to develop customized solutions for simple as well as more complex biological issues. And that's why we are confident that the integration of DIY technology toolbox will highly enrich synthetic biology. And you can take part in it. Just download the instruction manuals from our wiki, order the required parts, and take your first step into becoming a DIY bioengineer. Thank you for your attention.